My name is Bernie Daler, and today I have with me Doug Matheson. Uh, hello, Doug. Welcome Hi to the webcast. Hey, uh, Doug, you just wrote a book. Uh, can you give us a brief um, description of what is the title and what's it about? Well, it's titled Actually Thinking Versus Just Believing. Um, and it's my attempt to say we have a lot of serious challenges in the world today from let's say stuff that might be into the natural sciences, uh, climate change, ocean acidification, to socio-cultural challenges, how, how we humans can get along, how sometimes we fail to get along, and in the light of those challenges that we need our best problem solving. But one of the characteristics, one of the features of good problem solving is in scientists' open-minded willingness to say, I'll be darned. My old idea turns out to not be supported by the best evidence. I'm gonna. I need to change my mind, uh -huh. and then change our mind. And then, if we can bring that kind of thinking, that kind of objectivity, that what I'll, I'll call personal honesty, to our problem solving, first of all, personally, and then collectively, that I think we can be up to the challenges of our times. But there are things that get in the way of that kind of personal honesty and that kind of collective honesty. There are things that tend to cultivate and reinforce and refine our tendencies to just believe what we want to believe, to hang on to beliefs of preference, to stay in the shoes we grew up in, comfortably there. Nobody has a right to challenge me. I don't have a right to challenge you. And we should all just respect each other's various beliefs, whether or not those beliefs hold any water. And I think to hang on to beliefs that don't hold water, the reason it matters is that we become lousy or we stay lousy problem solvers. And I don't think we can afford to do that. So is your, is your book about religion a lot too or just thinking in general? Well, I certainly do touch on on religion. Um, very definitely, I make some controversial statements, I suppose, because um, I think if if you ask yourself, where do humans get the most cultivation of, the most reinforcement of, the most refinement of our tendency to just believe what we're already comfortable believing? Can you think of any place? where we get more reinforcement and refinement of that than within religion. And I, I've looked long and hard, and I don't find any place where we get more reinforcement of that than within religion. And so parts of my book um, deal directly with that. One of my chapters deals directly with evolution. Looks like somehow we're going away. No, we're back. And Yeah, and well, cer so, yeah certainly... Uh, Certainly, religion is the thing closest to our hearts. I mean, closest to our lives. Um, so let me let me ask you a question. So you were, um, would you say you were a Christian missionary at one point? Well, yes, absolutely. You know, first of all, I, I grew up a missionary kid in India, so I grew up um, in a loving Christian home. You know, not no abusive parents. I wasn't beat to death with a Bible or anything. I, you know, I had a loving God and all kinds of positive things. And I was educated in uh, Christian schools all the way first grade through college. Um, and so, yeah, I, I grew up within conservative Christianity. Uh, um, and I taught. I went on my first jobs. I was a science teacher of all things for the same church I had grown up in for the better part of a decade and, and public health work too because I went as a tech quote missionary to the little country of Rwanda in Africa and, and was doing public health work even if I wasn't doing evangelism. Um, so yeah, I, I come deeply from within conservative Christianity. Okay. Um, yeah, one thing I'd like to talk about tonight is we were both Christians, and we both had a spiritual, supernatural worldview where we thought there was actual a supernatural existence for things like heaven and hell and God and demons and things like that. And now we both don't. 
Um, could you could you briefly explain um, how you used to believe uh, in supernatural things and why you don't now? Just maybe uh, two minutes or so, and we have somebody we can somebody in the audience we we could ask a question too. But just like two minutes, how two or three minutes? How do you used to believe in uh, supernatural and, and now and why you don't? Well, I guess I'll spend less time on that. I used to, but yeah. But if you grow up in conservative Christianity, you you have a a God, uh, the you know the the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and you have Lucifer, Satan, and his angels, and you have the good angels, and you have a spiritual world where there's a battle between good and evil, and and that whole thing was absolutely how I saw the world. Um, and how I began, and I didn't, in any short period of time, completely rebel from that. I I just struggled as somebody who who really did believe that there should be a pretty good degree of match between the things we hold to be true, the things we believe, and good evidence. That you shouldn't have a complete dichotomy of one's over here and one's over there and I have to choose. So as I got through college and as we're in high school I've been told evolution is a bunch of absolute hogwash nonsense. Um, there are evil people out there who've just made this up and the devil has m helped them make it up. It's complete nonsense. There is no order in the fossil record. End of story. Got to college and still had Christian college professors but who were some of them um, geologists and, and fairly informed people and they said no you know what there is a pattern to the fossil record it's real you can check these layers we don't buy into the time frame the 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 evolutionists put on them and we don't think that the pattern is there because of all these millions of years of slow change we say that the pattern is there because the flood caused the pattern things were buried in, in order according to where they lived to begin with and then how mobile they were and how smart they were to get away. And at first I thought, oh good, at least there's an explanation. But then you begin to think, I mean, very quickly and you go, man, that's kind of a, a really wimpy, lousy explanation. Because if there were mammals and birds at the time of the flood and by the fossil record, they got buried last, so that's why we only, we only find them in the upper layers and we find all that other stuff in lower layers. Well, in you know, weren't there any old sick ones that died the week before the flood who didn't run away and get to high ground and get buried last? Shouldn't we find a rabbit or a deer or a bear or a tiger or a chimp or a horse or a dog or a, an eagle or a crow or a sparrow? Anything. Shouldn't <laughs> we find some down there with these, you know, before the fish even, in the lowest layers because they, by coincidence, and the sheer absence of random chaos to the fossil record really hit me between the eyes and I said you can't ignore that that's just real it's verifiable and, and it's checkable across the board and and for a number of years I read stuff from church literature from an organization called the Geoscience Research Institute that kept trying to find ways of of reconciling things and they and I it was transparently dishonest many times how they'd simply manipulated and twisted and so and so I began to say you know what there's a really lousy level of match between what we're being told is true and what the evidence says and then I got into astronomy and I learned a lot oh, about yeah, space yeah. Spent two summers researching it and and yeah. I I came to it as a science teacher to the point that I said you know what I can no longer teach for this organization that says the earth is 6,000 years old and the fossil record was created by the flood, etc. And, and then you, it becomes beyond the science issues where you just see we're, n we're not insisting with personal honesty. And I, personally, I think, I like looking at myself in the mirror and say I'm not knowingly, willingly fooling myself. You know I'm what? Sure. You know Go what's ahead. kind of funny is, I mean, sometimes people say, you know, I agree. I agree completely with you. Evolution is a huge problem for theology. But then some people say, "Well, you know, the Catholic Church, they accept evolution, but you know, um, they're they're actually when you get down to the details, there's some problems." But it's kind of like, 
okay, well, are you saying the Catholic Church is reasonable? Because this is the church that is actually saying that the priest, you know, holds up a wafer, and after he does his incantation, he says, this is literally the body of Jesus. Even though it doesn't look like it, right. this is literally the body of Jesus. So it's like, right. uh, you know, talk about scientific thinking. How much more can you conflict <laughs> with exactly what you see? And, you know, right. so, I mean... And so, you know, I, I agree with you. My, my first stuff, in any case, was a struggle with reconciling science. And as I got further and further, and I said, you know, less and less of this washes. And you're quite right. Though I, I sometimes tell Adventist friends, look, at there, there are theistic evolutionists, and at least I think they're taking a step towards honesty. They're not living in complete denial of the fossil record. And the genetic um, evidence, we now know the genomes of so many things, and it matches so well with what we understand um, about a uh, natural selection okay yeah. so yeah. then you get into the the weird spirit world stuff and and there's much there too and I sometimes ask myself okay it's good to acknowledge all the possibilities and I would say oh sure it's possible there's this God there's that God there's the other God but a few of the common sense things that I ask theistic evolutionists like Catholics to to notice when they're they're so sure that you know their God's right, I say, listen. First of all, all cultures have their gods and their explanations of the universe, and really, truly, none of those is any more verifiable than the, than the next. And secondly, I'd say, what is the greatest single determinant of people's faiths, whether you're a, a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Jew or a, a Catholic or a Protestant or whatever? The single greatest qu determinant is simply the coincidence of birth. The family and culture and century that you were born in. That's okay. it in a nutshell. Yeah. And to place a great amount of credence on the coincidence of birth that way I think is unbelievably naive. You could, had you been born someplace, you could be a believer in Thor or a believer in Ray or a believer in any number of gods over time. Right. And so, yeah, so the sort of thing to do is to step back and say, you know what, i got all these religions to choose from, and none, and which one makes the best sense. Right, and, and so when you, you look at, again, to bring the natural stuff in, you look at astronomy, you see stars being born, stars forming. We see protoplanetary disks around some young stars. We know how planets form. It's right. not magic. We know what's going on inside of stars, the fusion that generates all that energy. We know how stars age. We know that bigger ones die first and smaller ones last longer. We understand right. these things. You don't need to revert to magic. Newton figured out gravity and quit reverting to magic to explain things. And the progression of human understanding is that, that we continue to be able to understand things and not just say, well, it's magic. Right, you know, like, for example, young Earth creationists, they, they think, for example, um, the Earth is like, or, and the universe is like 6,000 years old, and you say, well, what about, uh, we could see a supernova explosion, and let's say it's a billion light years away, that means it takes a billion years for that light to get here, that actually happened a billion years ago, and they're like, no, actually, it's just, uh, God, you know, he, he made that light in transit and everything, so... <laughs> that's what that means is God is a liar because it looks like you're watching a movie of something that happened after that really never happened, you know. So and, and it it makes great sense, doesn't it, that that God would set up so many scenarios to deliberately mess with our minds. I'm going, mm -hmm. come on, get real. Well, yeah, I mean, like I, for I, example, you know, if Adam and Eve had a, you know, if they're in the garden and there's a huge tree, let's say a huge oak tree, and if you cut it in half on the sixth day there, you know, if you cut it in half and you saw count all the the tree rings, you know, if you counted 100 tree rings, that means it was 100 years old, but no, it was only, you know, you know, a couple days old. Right. So, <laughs> you know, and that's the old, the old thing that Adam and Eve have belly buttons. I mean, you know, the only people who are born need a belly button, so if you weren't born, you wouldn't need that, you know. Yeah, and and now the, the, the paleontology that then merges with archaeology to give us a more and more and more complete picture of our own history that you know it's not only ferns and redwood trees and jellyfish and salmon that have evolutionary stories you know ancestries but if you go digging in the caves and, and compare the DNA of not only Neanderthals but some of the other 
offshoot but obvious relatives of modern humans mm -hmm. to to deny that we too have a story that goes back and can be checked is just flying in the it's it's desiring deliberately to just believe in magic rather than let's check the evidence and I as, oh. as attractive as the magic stuff is I beg my fellow human beings to to pay attention to verifiable evidence because it matters if we just allow ourselves to believe what we'd rather believe that spills out of the religious domain in our heads and pretty soon we're denying other stuff we don't want to believe we deny climate change we deny uh, stressed ecosystems and the loss of biodiversity and we deny ocean acidification and we deny the seriousness of the national debt and we deny all kinds of stuff just because we are willing to presume that what we were told when we were kids and it felt good that Jesus is coming back so I'm not letting go of that I'm, uh, that's the solution so I can shrug off like water off a duck's back all these other challenges that are so real and need our attention and need our most objective and honest problem solving that's why it matters that's why I'm willing to step on toes and ruffle feathers because other you know 15 years ago I still ha I, I had all the my internal doubts but I wasn't being public about them because I figured live and let live there's no harm done if Joe or Susie you know believes in their version of God and everything's cool but I have realized since then that that the tendency to believe what we want to believe leads to habituation and once you're habituated that way you, you seek out comfort zones and you avoid like the plague anything that messes with your comfort zone and that is a recipe for never solving problems and I don't think we have a right to sit here and fritter away decades while we've got seven billion headed for eight billion people gonna ruin planet Earth for future generations out very far. I think we owe a decent, stable, and sta hap enjoyable planet to future generations. We're not gonna live up to that obligation if we don't get a whole lot more honest about um, sorting out fact from fiction in our own heads mm -hmm. and right. fact from fiction in political life and in scientific life. Well, um, let's see what uh, Jersey has to say. Jersey, are you uh, with us? Yeah, I'm with you. Can you hear me? Yeah, Jersey is my colleague at a, a company we work, which will be nameless. Um, looks mm -hmm. like you're not on video, though. You just have a freeze frame picture there. Um, I'm on a I don't know why, but my video seemed to be going on and off. But just yeah. give it a oh. second. I can see him live now. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Oh, hey, we see you. Yeah. Cool. Oh, so what do you have to say about all this? Well, it's fascinating discussion. I think we're preaching to the choir a little bit, but uh, <laughs> it would be interesting to to get people who are on the fence, like um, one of those people who signed up originally, Marley. She signed up. She says she's not ready to let go of the concept oh. of God, and she was interested in discussing this with people who are open-minded, because I think that's where we get the greatest impact. Because you know, among us, I think we probably agree a lot on on this what we're dealing with in terms of real world and uh, and the metaphysical world with the other people we're dealing with. But where do we impact, and how do we impact the world? Is I think what we all feel passionate about. How do we go and help some people understand that there is a be better way or maybe there is a way that has a more real impact in the world versus something that uh, they think has impact like prayer or you know um, following certain political um, aspirations. Right, I mean I think people like Marley, uh, I think she grew up as a Christian, and she's still in a Christian circle, probably like me and Doug, and so that's why I'm doing these kind of talks mm -hmm. with people like Doug. Because Jersey, I don't think um, you never did believe in the supernatural, did you? Well, 
I grew up in a Catholic Orthodox family, so I was always, uh, until teenage years, going to church. And um, I think I was testing God until teenage years, but from that point, about 15 or 17, it didn't make sense to me, so I stopped believing. I still went through the motions from time to time with my parents because it was important to them, but you know, internally, I was already sort of a live and let live atheist not minding what's going on until I met some religious people in US where actually uh, I found them to be very scary um, and I saw impact of uh, how what they had on people's minds and how brainwashed they were and how um, immoral their values and consciousness would become because of this ideology so once I started seeing this I really felt more strongly about being um, anti-theist, which means going out there and starting to promote some of the more realistic ideas, more rational thinking and critical thinking, yeah. to help them, at least some of them who are closer to the fans, overcome those delusions. You know, Doug and I, uh, trying to get this webcast going, we had a lot of technical problems, and yeah. I think when we were both Christians, we probably would have said, um, you know, maybe God's trying to give us a message, or the devil's, or the devil's trying to stop us, or something, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think, Doug? Absolutely, absolutely, and I guarantee you that there are probably some people out there now who think that we're we're probably wrestling with principalities and powers, to use a quote that I grew up with. You know, um, so it's 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 funny to look at stuff like that. Yeah, um, Jersey, did you have a question for? Um, did you have a question for Doug? Um, no, actually, I didn't have a specific question. Uh, since you mentioned the technical difficulties, there, there were two other people with me on the other Hangout, because there was a link initially, and there was Jack Crone, I think, and then Philip something. Oh, Jack, oh. Crone. Yeah, but... Jack Crone is from the Klamath Basin, I'm quite sure. Uh huh. Okay, so you guys had your little Hangout without us then, because yeah, uh, we're just we weren't able chatting. to do this. And waiting, okay. so nothing really. Uh, we didn't get into any content or topics, but yeah. just trying to figure out how to join. So hopefully we can end up posting a recording and then maybe do a, a live one again sometime and have a few yeah. um, technical issues um, sorted out. You know, uh, sorry, the, um, what's his name again? Jer Jersey. Jersey. Jersey, you mentioned you know prayer and stuff, and I've posted some things on Facebook sometimes that have irritated some of my friends who happen to still be people of faith. And one of the things I posted um, was, you know, a a doctor saying, "Oh, you know, you you've got God on your side. You can pray about it. You don't need me." And some people were re real irritated with me about that. And then I had posted another thing that simply pointed out, it's funny. You know, here in the West, where we've got hospitals and doctors and MRI machines and everything of the kind, it's amazing how many prayers got answers. But you go to Outback Africa, where people have a sick little kid who has nothing but severe diarrhea. That's all. Yeah, and they die from and it too, right? In the fervency of prayer, they're begging God to please, 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 somehow save my little kid here. And millions of little kids under the age of five per year die in Africa of something as simple as dirty water and bad diarrhea. And don't tell me those people don't pray. So how is it that God's so tone deaf to the poor, illiterate African? And obviously, people, the conclusion is not that God's tone deaf to the poor, illiterate African. It's that here we read answered prayer into the good things we can do through modern science. We've got clean water. We've got great hospitals. We've got MRI machines. We've got great surgeons. And we misattribute that to magic in the sky. And the magic in the sky yeah. doesn't work someplace else. And it ought to just be a wake-up moment to say, you know what, that's not an insult. I'm sorry. I, I know that if this gets played and it gets to the wrong hands, geez, you know, I'll have some people pissed off at me, but I've reached the point where I'm willing to live with pissed off people. If I can provide the necessary ice water in their face to wake them up and say, you know what, 
I've been believing in wishful thinking, I've been believing what I want to believe, and I've been believing in the face of the evidence, against the evidence, and it doesn't make me a better problem solver. It makes me a worse problem solver because we need to be willing to change our minds on any and all topics. We have deniers out there about climate change. But you know, uh, way, I some, but Doug, you know, I, I think some, a big part of it too is that you're you you're a person who has seen the change. I mean, you actually lived in Africa and you saw you saw this stuff firsthand. A lot of people in America, especially. It's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. They don't know about this stuff, and if they if they do know about it, they they tune it out. For example, you can see you know the poor starving kids on the internet or the TV, but you just put the channel. But you know you actually served over there, and you just can't tune it out like that. So you you're thinking about these things more than the right, average. And, and, and that's one thing that motivates me to to speak up more because I think sometimes people haven't had a thought provoking thing hit them upside the head and go, wow, I need to think about that. And so that's part of why I speak up. But I, I so strongly encourage people, you can't tell yourself that I can't look at things from another perspective until I've been forced into those shoes. One of the, sh I will call it a shame, that on the political right, there tend to be many, many people who hang on to every single one of their traditions until something personal shakes them out of it. Let me give you the example. Dick Cheney, unlike people on the right who have all their traditions, Dick Cheney is flexible when it comes to um, gay marriage. And the only reason he's flexible when it comes to gay marriage is because one of his daughters is gay. Well, you shouldn't have to be forced to wear another person's shoes till you can see things from another angle. And so I, I keep begging people, stay open-minded to learning, become aware, you don't have to become an expert. No, I'm not a PhD in anything. I, I just want to understand life in the universe and I keep exploring and as the decades of life go on, I keep exploring and reading widely and I'm not afraid to read stuff I don't happen to disagree with, I sorry, I don't happen to agree with to begin with. I'm willing to expose myself to ideas that are new and different. I got a question for you, Doug. When you were a Christian, were you um, ever like afraid of the dark or afraid of spiritual attack or demon demonic attack or anything like that? Uh, I would say, in a vague sense, yes. Um, but I I was never overwhelmed by it. I wasn't heavily haunted by a demon possessed world. I I just was sure that there were devils and you didn't play on their turf. So you didn't play with Ouija boards. You know, I had some friends who experimented with things like Ouija boards, and geez, when I was 14, I wasn't going to touch the things because I was convinced that if I played with the Ouija board, that I would be inviting the devil into my brain, and then he could mess with my head big time. What so about now? now what, so what if, yeah, so now could you play with the Ouija board now if you wanted to? Now I could mess with a Ouija board, and I wouldn't be the least bit scared because I'm not... I've looked in the eyes up close of drunk Rwandan soldiers with machine guns cocked. And I don't need to see a devil to see that the human heart and mind is greatly capable of being noble, just being self-sacrificing, being great, bringing out our best. And I don't mean to pick on drunk Rwandan soldiers. I've seen evil in the eyes of fellow Americans. And it's not a spiritual evil. It's just that we have, we have, unlike hyenas that just pretty much operate from instinct, we have a much, we have much, much more between our ears. And we yep. have a capacity to develop and enhance our good side that looks out for each other, that buys into the idea that so many want to forget today that the Founding Fathers wrote into the preamble of the Constitution that one of the purposes is to promote the general welfare, which I paraphrase as looking out for the broader good. That's a now, good part well, of us. Okay, so you know, going back to the Ouija board thing, was there a time when, was it kind of dramatic in your life when you said like, hey, there's nothing to this Ouija board, there's nothing supernatural here, or was it just so gradual that you didn't even notice a difference? Like, Well, it, it was gradual from the time I was in my early 20s and really starting to think 
uh, maybe even my late teens, on, on into, I would say, my late 30s. So you're talking about two decades there of slow, gradual, steady progress. And I will say that some of the last straws, while working in Rwanda, before the genocide broke out, before the chaos hit, um, I, I managed a network of five clinics in the outback, and one of the things that the the head nurse person that we didn't have a, we didn't have a doctor at each of these mini hospitals. We had a head nurse, and they they functioned like a doctor, and that they had to diagnose, they had to do um, pre prescription, they had to do tiny surgeries. Okay, they had to refer out to a hospital if it was complex. Anyway, a few of them shared with me that sometimes they simply couldn't cure a person who they couldn't diagnose a disease. They didn't have malaria, they didn't have this, they didn't that, and that person would spiral downward. And I, and I honestly said to him, so what's up in those, what do you think? He said, oh, well in those kind of cases, it's that they've been cursed. I said, oh, explain to me more. Because by, at that point in time, I still drew a paycheck from a church, but I was already a severe skeptic. So I said, explain more. They've begun cursed? He said, yeah, they're in the countryside there are kind of like witch doctors, and somebody can pay them and they can put a curse on somebody they're mad at. And if the person receiving the curse realizes he's been cursed, man, they, they spiral downward. And, and there's no medicine we can give them to, to fix them. They just get worse. And if, if they have the right um, pastor-type person who's on the good side with God show up and pray for them, then maybe they'll get better. You know what? If there's, no, if, there, if there's no medicine they can give them, what about if they fly them into the United States? Uh, we have yeah. medicine that might help right. them, right? Right, and so my question for these head nurses was, I said, okay, you know what? Do you think there's anything possible that it's really primarily in their head? They believe this stuff, and they sort of smiled and wiggled and weren't sure. I said, tell you what, if you know people in your community and you know some good witch doctors, you tell one of them. You know that white guy who comes through with the Jeep and the medicine supplies once a month? Put a curse on him. And they at first oh. said, no, 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 no. We, we won't put a curse, you know, I'm not even going to ask. I said, no, please, do me this favor. Ask that a curse be put on me. Do it. And I said, you know, you hold no liability over there. There's not a big issue with liability anyway. But I said, just do it. And so one of them finally said, okay, I'll ask a witch doctor to put a curse on you. I said, now make a prediction with me. Do you think it will work? And they looked me right in the eye and broke into a big smile and said, you know what, I don't think it will work. And I said, and tell me why. He said, because you don't believe it. I said, I bingo. Know. There you go, psychosomatic. So the power, the power of that curse is that the local village guy, who doesn't know any better, his mind goes into that downward spiral because he believes he's been cursed, he believes in those powers of darkness, and it's a one-way trip to even dying. But the power of the mind over the body is immense. Okay, well, uh, I think that's pretty much it for our uh, webcast today. Let's uh, let's ask Jersey if he has any closing uh, comments or questions. Well, a couple things. So, since you were talking in Africa, I have not been there, but I've been reading quite a bit about some of the witch tradition, witch doctor traditions, and the spells and all this stuff that is going on there right now. And it's sad what's happening because uh, you probably heard that quite often they blame newborn babies for certain predicaments that happen to other people and they end up actually killing the babies. They end up destroying innocent lives just because somebody blames it for a sickness or disease that um, another person experiences or maybe misfortune. And there, there are examples where parents actually kill their own child because of this and just extremely cruel and, and sad at the same oh. time. I haven't heard that. It, yeah, and it, it comes down to this type of set of beliefs taking away people's consciousness and um, basically morality and any kind of rational thinking. Um, and, and, and it's a huge impact on, on those yeah. people who, who are basically poor and uh, they don't have any means to learn any different. That's their culture and it's embedded in it. And I feel very empathetic towards them because our ability to really change th their predicament is very limited. Uh -huh. And you see, really that, nothing... that shows the, the power and the tragedy of superstition. And, and we yeah. need to simply broaden yeah. our minds to what is superstition because we look at Hindu gods with 
elephant oh, ears yeah. and elephant trunks and so forth, and we laugh and smile and so forth. But if oh, we yeah. could step into the shoes of a Hindu or uh, any number of other people and look at some of the stories we've grown up telling ourselves within Christianity, we'd break into a smile too. Yeah, 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 then, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, it's kind of funny. You said, you know, you, we laugh at the, all the Hindu gods, like the elephant, the one with the elephant head, Ganesh, you know, and all that. But you know, when you think about, like I said earlier, the Catholic Church is, you know, if you consider the Church as Catholics, because I was an evangelical Christian, they said Catholics aren't even true church, uh, Christians anyway. But, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, of course, they self-identify as Christians, and you know, by numbers. Uh, Roman Catholicism is the largest by far, and here they are thinking that this wafer is literally Jesus, and the wine is literally his blood, you know, and the priest does his incantation over it. So, yeah, I mean, these religions can very easily see how the other one looks so goofy. And then the other comment I wanted to, to leave also is in regards to challenging some of these beliefs and when to do it, because I think, and, and maybe some of it comes from reading uh, Peter Bogosian's book, but uh, you know he he wouldn't pass the opportunity to do this. On the other hand, I'm trying to find the right opportunity to interact and challenge this because here is an example um, from our work. A coworker who we regularly run with um, had some really difficult time moving his legs, and he went to the hospital. Turned out he said, had something in his brain. And oh, wow. all of a sudden, the whole group of people of the runners started exchanging emails saying, "Let's pray for him. You know, let's oh. put a mass. Let's do all these different supernatural things." And I knew that they were believers, but the amount of support for that belief all of a sudden became so overwhelming that in that time it would be, you know, natural for me to say, "Well, that doesn't really matter. Just, you know, forget this. Let's go and visit him. Let's go do something that may." help the situation rather than praying but obviously just like you yeah. said Doug, they, he had good care, uh, doctors went in, they did surgery on his brain, removed some infection and he's getting better to the point that he's walking now so what's the exchange now? The exchange between them now is um, well let's keep praying, you know it's working <laughs> it has proven our point. Um, yeah, that's, that's, well, that's, one of the... that's not the right timing for me to step in and really tell them, hey, you know, you guys are totally delusional. This is you're right. We have to be we have to be careful, but I th I think the time we're going to have to start to be more assertive than we've been in decades past. And yeah. you know that's and that's true too that. Uh, you know, um, Christians, they, they're under this delusion, you know, and I'm a former Christian, that when you're praying, you're actually doing something. You know, for example, you know, there's a big um, earthquake uh, or a, or a uh, not, not a tsunami, was it a hurricane in the Philippines, you know, so what should we do? Let's all pray. So all the Christians get together and pray, and after they're done praying, they can think like, wow, we really did something, when in fact, they really didn't do anything. And if they didn't believe in that prayer, you know, like an atheist, then they'd be more motivated to actually do something. You got to give some money or something, or at least feel guilty. But you can't feel guilty as a Christian because you, they actually think they did something when they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. Indeed. Yeah. Well, um, thank you guys for coming on. We're still learning how to use this uh, Google Plus and and all this. And I, I see my my video just got my graphics just got lost. Um, but anyway, yeah, thank you guys for coming on, and uh, hopefully we'll figure this stuff out, and the devil will quit persecuting us on his Google Plus Hangout stuff. <laughs> so. All right, great to be with you guys, and we'll stay yeah. in touch. Good to okay. meet you. Let's talk right. to you later. Bye. Okay, bye. Talk to you later.